Should we get started? Thank you all for coming. Um, it is really my sincere pleasure to have the opportunity to finally introduce you to David Dow. Uh, this brief visit to campus uh, is his first in 53 years, and it's been, I think he will tell you, a very emotional time, uh, having arrived just yesterday late in the afternoon and spending today walking around campus, a campus that's very different than when he was here in the early 60s. Um, I've thoroughly enjoyed talking with David starting about five years ago, I think it was. Did we agree that was about? At least. Good enough, right? It's five years ago, and I'm certain that you're going to um, feel the same way after this evening's program. I'd like to tell you just a little bit about David's background. Um, David actually began making paintings in around 1960 when he was a student here at Kenyon um, and a studio mate actually of Graham Gund. They had a shared space in the tower in Pierce Hall. Uh, and David had actually immigrated to the United States from Hong Kong just about five years before that um, and ultimately decided to come to Kenyon. And he might share a little about that decision making with you. The story of his childhood and intervening years, including over 50 years of engagement with the trajectory of modern and contemporary art, um, and the influence of several artistic movements in particular, including minimalism, abstract expressionism, uh, and color field painting are, are really ever present in your work. I think you're going to see that on the screen to my right. Often you can make out quite direct references, uh, intentional references to other artists, um, like Ad Reinhardt, Jackson Pollock, uh, Barnett Newman, Malevich, and a number of others. Additionally, he often includes archival material, as you've seen upstairs in the exhibition on view now, referencing personal history um, and the history of 20th century painting. David utilizes this material to supplement his own memory uh, of past events, whether personal, uh, as you see on view upstairs, um, or artistic, as in a number of bodies of work that he'll share with you in this presentation tonight. After graduating from Kenyon in 1964, David studied briefly at the Cooper Union and continues to live in New York to this day. He was also a faculty member of the Whitney uh, Museum Independent Study Program from 1970 through 2000. David's paintings are included in quite a number of uh, collections, including the Hirshhorn, MoMA, the Whitney, SF MoMA, and numerous others. In 2014, David's work was featured in a solo show at the Aldrich Contemporary Art Museum. And in 2015, a very large scale comprehensive retrospective was organized uh, by the Ulens Center for Creat uh, Contemporary Art in Beijing. A large catalog of that exhibition is forthcoming and long awaited. I keep checking. Um, and the Gund Gallery will also be producing a catalog documenting this body of work on view upstairs. So I hope you might watch actually for future announcements about the availability of that publication. We're very pleased to be able to produce. So please join me in welcoming back David Dow to Kenyon College. It's a great pleasure to be here. I, as Natalie said, I'm actually very emotional about it. I mean, the hours not so long of coming from New York, a few hours, every moment I think I was thinking of moments from 53 years back as a completely wet back, wet, no, not wet back, but wet behind the years kid knowing nothing arriving at this place. And later, well, I don't know what I learned, but, you know, <laughs> I had a lot of good times, and I became the person I am, much as a result of my four years here. And, well, anyway, I, I would just attempt to show some stuff. Uh, it, it's not easy to show 50 years of work, so this is quite a selection, and Probably afterwards, I'll say I should have remembered something else, but nevertheless, here it is. 
uh, my beginnings in New York had to have been very influenced by uh, the abstract expressionists who were considered uh, most important art at the time. And uh, one of the things they were very interested in was large scale and idea of immediacy, or at least not a kind of European painting where you make a small study and you blow it up. Whatever you did had to be right there. And this was somehow internalized in the works I did from the very beginning. This painting, for example, is from 1971, and it's 8 by 12 feet. But they're done in a scale not of small brushes, but actually of two swaths, two channels of paint. And I did these using cardboard tubes that you find in the streets. So the thought was, if I scaled up the instrument, then it's as if somebody much bigger than a human person had actually done the mark. And with no pre-thinking, pre-thought, just trying to achieve a place where two swaths could react and give you a sense of a new place, a new painting. A similar one from 72. And one important thing happened between the last and this one. The first ones were still named untitled. And in that case, it was called 1971-A as a direct reference to Clifford Still's titling of his work. This one is called Wealth of Nations. At the time, the ethos of abstraction was such that you were supposed to not have it relate to anything in the world in any narrative, literary, historical sense. It had to be only about color and shape and form. So to name a painting actually by the title of a book was in some ways a kind of critical act. And I thought of it as such. But of course, it had to very easily been be thought of as books because you have like an open book right there. Well, anyway, this kind of immediate, uh, spontaneous, uh, gestural kind of work, albeit in a big scale, became uh, a way of working. But at the same time, it became very uh, impoverished for me in terms of moving on. I began to crave and uh, 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 miss deliberate shape making. And also these were done on the floor because I happened to have a studio with a lot of floor space. And then I moved to a studio with higher walls but less floor space. And that gave me a chance to get back to the wall, to what I thought of at that point as a kind of back to basics. And basics consisted of plain geometry, Basics considered of like just color and flatly painted space. But it kept up the idea of spontaneity and immediacy in that, again, there are no pre-thinking, no uh, preparatory drawings. This seven and a half by seven foot painting would begin with maybe half a circle. And the next circle would overlap it. So it would be a repeated layering of changes and, and ed editing until finally something happened that seemed fresh and unseen before. And I could say the reason I, took, I picked geometry, plain geometry, is because I didn't have a kind of traditional art training. I had a very good color course from Joe Slate here, but I didn't learn to draw that figure and position it in space. So an easy way, and in fact, an only possible way for me to make art was to do very simple geometrical shapes. But at the same time, geometrical shapes is a universal language that everyone knows. So I'm able to exploit the viewer's foreknowledge of that knowledge. So if you see a part of a circle peeking out or a curve peeking out behind something, 
you could imagine that as a whole shape behind the plane that's hiding it, thereby complexifying an otherwise simpler space. Here's another example of the same kind of thinking. This one means 7 by 13 feet. And this one is called Morocco. And I began beyond titles of books to name paintings after movies. And of course, you might know the movie Morocco. But it also, in this case, references the Moroccans by Matisse, which is in MoMA. Well, anyway, this way of working, I did uh, the geometrical ones for about seven years. And somehow, the idea of behind modernism, of something about the original, of eat, coming up with something nobody has ever seen before, was a kind of uh, unspoken ethos of modernism. And that became very stifling because I realized I couldn't do it. So that and the fact that uh, uh, I didn't have a gallery at that moment for a while, so there was not any support from the world, caused me at some point, the, the, basically the, in, the internal contradictions of this way of working came to uh, uh, a, a, a very fallow period for me at that time. And so I didn't really do much work for a few years. And when I did come back to painting, this was the first painting after several years of no activity. And this painting is called On Our Land. What it is is a depiction of the Palestinian flag on the left, which I picked up at a march on Fifth Avenue People were handing it out as flyers. And somehow I saw a connection of that to a suprematist drawing. A suprematist were the Russian uh, avant-garde of the teens and 20s. And this one is by somebody named Shaznik, very not as famous as Malevich, but really up there as one of the Russian avant-gardists. So formally, they both have the inverted triangle. But one is a potential or, or, or wannabe nation's flag, and the other one is a kind of suprematist, albeit a kind of abstract art design. But at the time, the Russian avant-garde was beginning to be very, they, they were becoming very hot in the art world. People were all flying back to look at the avant-garde. So that's how I happened upon, upon it myself. So the question is, whose land? Is it uh, the land of uh, people asking for recognition? Or is it the land of art? Or is it politics? Is it art? Or is it amalgamation of both? How do you locate which land is what? So the, the point of it is, this is the beginning of my paintings, not just about itself not just about plasticity and shape and form and color, that every mark, every shape is relative or in reference to something in the world. And that was a big breakthrough. This painting, plus at that time in the early to mid 80s, of a kind of uh, conversation and discourse in the art world about uh, issues of what is the origin and what is the copy, the questions of authorship, the idea that, uh, well, those, those questions which came down to, in practice, the strategy of appropriation. So I learned a great deal from that. Uh, I was not the originator of that. Well, that's almost foolish to say because the whole argument is there's no such thing as the original. But in any case, Paintings, having, having done painting like this and those very important discourses in the world that I was in caused me to look very closely at this photograph. Now this happens to be 
a photograph. I promise if you look, open any book on abstract art, this would be in its opening pages. It is the installation shot of Malevich's first showing of suprematist paintings in St. Petersburg in December 1915. And it's a kind of image that's seared into the brain of anybody who has a visual kind of interest, a, 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 an interest in visuality and, you know, things uh, from visual culture. So I took this as the kind of reference to work on some paintings. In this case, I basically projected that photographic image onto a canvas with an opaque projector. In those days, we didn't have material like this. And um, traced it in two arrays, the red one and the ones that look like photographs as a second array, as a direct ac acknowledgment that the reference is a photograph. And the title of this is uh, Slippage. And this led actually into a whole series of work based on the same photograph. At the show of them, I was very careful to show the source. It's not that I came up with these images on my own. These images have a reference in the world. So that's on the left is the same image with its mirror image at the bottom. The one on the right attempts to, e to invoke the uh, power of Tatlin with the big circle spiraling up into space, an iconic image from the Russian Revolution and Russian avant-garde art. But it also had three. The first part revolved in one year. The second part revolved in one month. The third part in a day, well, something like that. But in this case, I used the original almost template of that photograph at the bottom. And the middle panel is a direct inscription of a painting by a German artist named Palermo, who made a painting called Eight Red, Red Rectangles, which in his case was a direct reference to Malevich's Eight Red Rectangles, who, which was one of the paintings in that show the photograph announces. And the top one is yet another painting from the 21 paintings from the photograph. So you see how my mind works. It has a way of like, you know, getting very lugubrious, I'm afraid. But anyway, that's called Tatling's Tower, 1915. And here's another one. Well, if you notice, most of these show the 21 paintings in the installation on the wall, but it took out the internal elements of the paintings. In this case, the external rectangles are removed, and only what's inside the 21 paintings are on the canvas, and thereby making a new painting of the innards of 21 paintings. While doing so, I also decided to put in the chair. That was part of the photograph. So this one, the title is, it's not strictly based on the Malevich photograph, but it's still revolving around looking at the Russian avant-garde as well as my old home base of abstract expressionism. It happens to be a redeploying of a painting by Franz Klein, and one of Malevich's paintings from the Stedelijk Museum. The title of this painting is Character Formation, Beware of False Friends. The Franz Klein painting is entitled Cardinal, hence Cardinal Rue. And the rule that I'm coming up with is Beware of False uh, what, what was it? Beware of false friends. Yeah. Les faux amis in French. 
which means you know, different languages have cognates that seem to be the same, but in fact mean different things. In this case, Franz Klein's paintings are sometimes likened to Chinese calligraphy. But in fact, they have nothing to do with Chinese calligraphy because he did stop and go. His are almost collaged elements. He would do a stroke and stop and maybe glue another piece on there and continue it. So it's stop and go, whereas Chinese calligraphy is based on breath. You don't stop mid-stroke. If you make a mistake, you start over. So right away, that's a fundamental difference. And this particular Malevich painting, which I reduced to just being black, in fact, it had other colors, always reminded me and to other people as a Chinese character. So there, too, is a false reading. So thereby, I combine these two things together. I was talking to some people upstairs about this painting. Now, one of the things I do is I try to collide difference. Difference is something to be valued, I think. You know, homogeneity and unity ends up being tautologous and trivial. But if you could put things that are incommensurable with one another, you know, at the level of even oxymoron, I think you can potentially have new possibility for meanings that you might not have had otherwise. In this case, it's simply that same Malevich rendered here as one unit and a Matisse cutout, a leaf cutout. The title of this is M&M, &M, and it's, of course, brown and peptobismo like M&M &M candies. I'm still involved, very aware, with the Russian avant-garde. Uh, this is about two or three years, two years after the Malevich photograph one. So here, the word constructivism in Russian, directly taken from a Rodchenko work, acts as a kind of prison bar. So it's a very literal saying that David Dial, whose name is here rendered in Russian, is behind constructivism as a prison. There's another version of this where it's in Chinese. So instead of Russian, it's a Chinese seal with my name in Chinese. And they form a pair. And the first time I showed it was you couldn't see both at the same time. They're on each side of a wall. So that notion of prison this is 1986. One, I felt like I was continuing to move away from my home base of New York, my first love, my uh, ancestors, my you know, great uh, predecessors. And I was getting too much into European avant-garde, European uh, abstraction. So I wanted to come home in some way. And I used. You don't really see it here, but there's a very famous painting by Robert Motherwell called The Span Little Spanish Prison. It's in, the, it's in the MoMA collection. It's about this big. And basically, it's just a series of vertical lines with one horizontal bar that happened to cross more than two of the vertical lines. That painting is very important in that Frank Stella came out of that. And people like uh, Sean Scully based his whole career on it. So I know this. Many people know this. I wanted to work with that in some way. So Robert Motherwell became a very good person for me for my trying to come home to New York. And I ended up calling this group of work, which is a combination of Malevich and Motherwell all the others. So it's basically Motherwell and Malevich. But it has the prison bars. So the title of this group of work is called Little Suprematist Prisons. And there are 30 of them. Started out as one or two. It grew to be 30. 
And they've not always been shown in their entirety, but usually when I've been shown, there'd be at least 10 or 12. And the curator of the show is always given the job of how to hang it. I'm not responsible for the particular configuration. But somehow they all evoke the same sense as that photographic image from Malevich. And from doing arrangement of 30 of them, it also allowed me to take selections thereof and make individual paintings. Well, not that it's an exact transcription, but the sense of those smaller paintings. The same idea as the inner parts of the Malevich being utilized to make a new painting without the surrounding borders. In this case, I was able to throw in the barcode. Uh, and there's uh, that same Malevich work. It's actually called Supremus 50 in the Stedelijk Museum in Amsterdam. So I made it into like a uh, uh, genealogical tree of all my heroes. And the point I was making is, is not just Pollock and Newman and Malevich, but there are other, or Mondrian, there are other people that are very important to this particular discussion. And they might not be as, inter, as famous or gendered male. And some of them might even be groups of people as opposed to individual proper names. So you would have Unovis, oh sorry, Unovis, which is a Russian avant-gardist group. You would have the Bauhaus. And actually, a very important personage for me is the designer named Pete Swart, who was part of the De Stijl group. His name was Pete Swart, and his monogram was a P with a black square. So the black square came to stand for the word black. And that became very useful for me in doing other work, as you might see later. And this is called iChart, and it's a lot of the same people from the Russian avant-garde that I made into this rebus of some sort. And there it is, like, eventually you will pick it out, that that spells constructivism. This was the happy result of a five-hour trip where somebody else was driving. <laughs> <laughs> and it's done in such a way that it's like uh, the kind of pale green of uh, stenographer's books, because it's IE's green, and just uh, like an eye chart for testing your eyesight. So this is the basically the garden that I was working in. And they had a lot to do with the various Russian avant, the, the various uh, European uh, art groups and avant-garde. And I combined it with this Chinese seal, which reads, let a hundred flowers bloom. Now, any fledgling historian of Chinese history would probably remember that this was the campaign in which Mao said, let a hundred flowers bloom, let 10,000 schools of thought contend, inviting people to criticize the government. At first, they were afraid to do so. But then they opened up. And the minute they did, they were sent away. So it was a very ho horrible episode in Chinese history. And I got to thinking that the squabbles and discord politically is not unlike the infighting that happened within the avant-gardist groups. I mean, everyone knows that uh, Mondrian could not accept Van Dosburg using a diagonal or a green. But there are you know, many shades of those kinds of like uh, infighting. So that's why I combine those two things. You have Schwitters. You have the, a kind of imprint from the Bauhaus publishing. You have the new left from Russia. You have presence from uh, Poland or, no, Czechoslovakia, I guess. M&A is another one. 
Le Cirque and Le Carré from France. Block is another one. Svornica. Neu Bilden something. That means the new art. And of course, the style. What's interesting is in my new work, I am exploiting the seal again. So this one is a direct transcription from a very small painting by one of the De Steyl artists, the guy who made the Bauhaus logo, Vilmos Huzal. He made a painting putatively using just geometrical shapes. But if you look closer, the shapes become like figures skating. The name of the painting is actually called The Skaters. And it's about this big. It's in Rotterdam. He, in fact, when making that, was making a reference to Northern European genre painting of people skating on the canals in the wintertime. But of course, he was doing a big taboo in terms of the kind of abstraction that his cohorts in Mondrian and uh, uh, Van Dosburg was promoting. Whereas another one of his cohorts, a guy named Van der Leck, was very famous precisely in making a kind of representational reference to horses and what have you, using rectangular and geometrical shapes. Well, anyway, I decided to make it in a large scale. And this is the first painting I made where I began to use just palette knives to make the paint. Before this, they were still mostly using paint brushes and palette knife. But this is exclusively palette knife. And the color in my mind had to do with like frozen ice on the canals. So it also allowed me to reference my knowledge that I am working in very dangerous territory by being so stuck in geometry. Hence the title of this is Skating on Thin Ice. Mm -hmm. And there's a direct transcription of some of those uh, so that, that specifically on the left is the Bauhaus logo by that Vilmos Hosea I mentioned. The one on the right is the famous Rietveld red and blue chair with the black frame taken out. And the title of the painting is Bauhaus Looks to De Steyl, because Rietveld was one of the chief De Steyl artists. This one is called China. It is the phonetic sound for China as spoken by a Chinese. So the point of this is to throw in the idea that language is not easy and there are problems in understanding and meaning and uh, knowledge of one another. If you're Russian, you would read it Zhongguo, and it wouldn't mean anything to you. If you're Chinese and you don't read Russian, you should recognize it as Cyrillic, possibly. But never the twin can possibly get together unless you happen to know both languages. And the color is coated with red on top and yellow at the bottom. OK, so already you might see my interest has a lot to do with like uh, genealogies and uh, history and so forth. Well, there is a very famous diagram on the book cover of a book by a, the founding director of MoMA called uh, uh, Cubism and Abstract Art. And many people take this to be like the carved in stone idea of how history and genealogy and lineage worked. But I discovered that for Alfred Barr himself, the chart was only, well, I, I'm getting ahead of myself. I should go back to the earlier painting. This was the first one. It basically is that chart 
done as a blackboard at the edge of being erased. The librarian from MoMA saw the painting, phoned me up, and said, you should come and see Alfred Baugh's own cover of that book where he made corrections. Where his point was, he didn't think of it as carved in stone. He used it as a monomic device to think up lineage, which could be changed. But in any case, I did it on a blackboard on the point of being erased. And it gave me a chance to call the painting Bar Talk, which is New York talk for bullshit. <laughs> So basically, usually when I hop on an idea, I try to do more than one version, or I try to extend it in whatever ways I can. So he, Alfred Baugh, had bifurcated the history of cubism and abstract art into geometric and non-geometric. So I took him at his word and made it geometric with rude lines on the right and curvilinear handmade marks on the left. And here's another book by Alfred Barr, since I was already on the subject. And from my research in the, in the stacks of MoMA, I discovered that Alfred Barr was asked to write this book, What is Modern Painting? Because he did so well with the earlier book that the museum wanted to capitalize on that. But he had a hard time writing this book. And he himself referred to this project as WIMP which is the, you know, the uh, initials for what is modern painting. And this is the second version of the book, with, designed by uh, a very famous designer named Georgie Kepish, who ran MIT. I did a painting of the first version of the book as well. So th the idea is once you hit on an idea, you try to you know, <laughs> make every second count. Uh, Today, we had a very lovely visit to the local cemetery. And it touched me a great deal because many of my professors are buried there. Literally, the people I study with are entombed, interned there. This one is called That Close. It happens to be an image map of the cemetery where Jackson Pollock is buried out on Long Island. And I came to do this because I would hear fellow artists of mine bragging that they were able to buy a plot in this land, in this cemetery. And I thought that was just so weird that, you know, so <laughs> in, in, in my mind, I got to think, you poor bastard, the only way you would achieve greatness is if, if, the only way you would achieve greatness is if you could be buried to genius. Genius, of course, would be Jackson Pollock. So there he is at the middle of the target. And the point of this painting is how close can you get? <laughs> so the, the closest to get to it is two, which is his wife, Lee Krasner. And then uh, that horizontal there, was where they extended the cemetery to make it bigger. So later, latecomers later, like Henry Geldseller and Hannah Wilkie, were able to get even closer than people on the other side who came earlier. And they are very interesting relationships, because it turns out that those two, less than 20 feet apart, is Stuart Davis and Ad Reinhardt and Harold Rosenberg, and you know various people. They're not, they're my personal heroes and people that mean something to me that's in the cemetery. Not you know canonical, necessarily. Like Liebling, who's a famous writer of some sorts, is there, but he means nothing to me, and he didn't make it to my cemetery. <laughs> and, and again, just to not waste anything, I've made versions of this painting where, in, where it included the people who got me the idea, because now they're dead and they're buried there. 
And there are other cemeteries I've made of Berlin, where you would have Schinko, the architect, and Marcuse, the philosopher, and Bertolt Brecht, the playwright. Again, people that are important to me. And presumably, I could make a painting of the Kenyan cemetery, but no promises. You know. <laughs> So it's clear by now that I'm not shy about overt reference. So it's, you know, one, one of the big uh, things I work against is a notion of art as mystery. I mean, I'm more interested in clarification and literal uh, direct reference. So at some point, I had this amazing uh, discovery that one of my big heroes, Barnett Newman, only made about 110 paintings in his whole life. And that flies in the face of the usual idea that important artists are productive, as in a Picasso. So knowing and finding out that Newman had such a small production, I decided to image it. But at the same time, it's because he had such a small production that I can image it. So the way I did it is in a numinous scale, where the different categories of his work on the drawings, prints, paintings, sculpture, what have you, is enumerated next to the year in which it was made. And I decided to reference his red, yellow, blue, who's afraid of red, yellow, blue paintings. And the happy accident is, if you were a book designer, you would not put blue on a red field. Because what that does is it creates a kind of uh, hallucination, a, a kind of sublime, if you will. So Newman was the artist who talked a lot about the sublime. So I sometimes refer to that work as my cheap sublime. And of course, that allowed me, uh, once I got the subject, it allowed me to do other versions of the subject. Here is every painting he made, the titles thereof, under the year it was made. Well, in any case, I've made almost 30 paintings referencing Barnett Newman. In this case, 1949 was a banner year for him. So those are the 18 paintings he made. Average, he averaged maybe four paintings a year, you know? So 18 paintings for him was very heavy, a banner year. So that has to be seen. Well, the idea is the entire painting would be the whole career. So 1949 would fall somewhere around there. And the other side of it is he had two years where he had no production. He had a heart attack, and he was very upset by the negative reaction to his first show, so he didn't work for a few years. Now, I can share with that myself. So here it is, the title of this is His Gap Years. And it also allowed me to make a beautiful monochrome, which in the end, you know, maybe that's all painting can, can be. <laughs> Another one referencing Barnett Newman. Oh, I might add that, you know, I knew him. I helped to hang his show at the Guggenheim in 1966, the Stations of the Cross. And he was somebody that has been a very important person for me. And I've had the catalog from the uh, uh, Stations of the Cross show for since 1966. It was printed offset paper, purple, beautiful purple, but I had it on my shelves for, you know, as long as since 1966. So the spine was abraded. The purple had fallen away and it had made that split. So I made a photo of it and had it silk screen on this painting. And it's called, of course, spying. 
And then I discover from the catalogue raisonné that there were works of his considered unfinished. And they were imaged in the catalogue raisonné. So I just made a compilation of the four unfinished paintings in scale, in scalar relationship to one another. Another book of uh, Barnett Newman that I have, Alan Stone Gallery gave a show to them as a two-person show, but he didn't want to take sides. So he had the same essay printed, one direct, with the name of the guy on one side, and in reverse, on what would have been the back side. So this painting is called Which Way Up? And you can be sure that I would always hang it with the Newman up. <laughs> so while doing all this uh, chronology of work of Barnett Newman, of 27-year career, I realized I was at that point 22 years with a public career. And I still was at that point where I refused to do autobiography. So maybe as a kind of lie to myself, I thought of using information about my own career, but throwing it out as the idea of me as an example of a larger class of people, an artist in late 20th century. Not David Yell, but just an instance of an artist. So what I did is I made this uh, painting where every show I had where I showed more than three paintings, it would get its own box with all the titles. And I allowed myself also to do this because like most artists, the career is quite checkered. It's not as if you step into the water and immediately it gets better and better and better. Usually, it's got a lot of ups and downs. In this case, there's a lot, of em a lot of empty areas. You know, it tries to pick up again, and then, you know. But luckily, towards the end, it's beginning to get full again. So this one, oh, I should also say, this painting is actually the title of this whole show. The whole sh there's a whole show based on this idea of how to image an artist's career and life. And it led me to reference uh, cl uh, cl uh, now I'm, I, I'm having a, a senior moment, I'm sorry to say. Who is the great realist French artist uh, who did the uh, meeting at Oran? And Corbet, Corbet. How could I forget? Yes. Corbet's famous painting that he called a real allegory, which is a huge painting of him painting uh, a boy representing innocence, dog representing faithfulness, his collectors, his critics, everyone, his whole milieu in this painting. So for me, this whole subject that I'm embarking on in this group of work is very related to the name again escapes me. Corbet. How is that possible? <laughs> so of course, every artist presumably has some record of who came to the studio. Here is the floor plans in scale. Not floor plans, but this, uh, the lofts, this, the sizes of the studios I had in New York, including one that I share with Jeff Way, my classmate from Kenyon College. And my sales record. So, you know, the idea of touching upon taboo subjects is, is also something that I think uh, has entered people's thinking or an artist's thinking if you begin with the notion that art making has to do with saying something critical or in opposition to the status quo. Well, conventionally, artists are not supposed to 
review their sales records. But here I did it because, again, it's not bragging about how many paintings I sold, but it's precisely because there are many years where there are no sales. So at some point, it, I realized that me standing in front of my CV is not unrelated to Barnett Newman standing in front of one of his paintings. And he very famously said that he wanted his paintings to be seen from a very close distance. And this is, you will find reams of literature of that quote alone. In my case, I, you know, I, I'm making a connection to one of my great heroes. That's a partial view of those paintings. And these two is part of the show, but you, it, it wasn't in the main room. It was in a separate room by themselves. What, this is a pair of paintings. What they are are geome geometrical paintings from the mid to late 70s with reviews of them on the painting. So in one case, it was a very positive article about this painting reproduced in this magazine. So the actual article got printed on the painting. And the painting, which was, was called Chinatown, after the movie Chinatown, as, is now renamed Plus. And then its twin is titled Minus because it happens to have some negative reviews with their analogous covers, silkscreen, on it. When I first showed that show in these paintings, some critic, somebody writing about it said, how can an artist destroy his own work? And my response, I didn't ha need to do it in public, but obviously the point of it is you're, new, you're making new work out of old work. And this was the final thing you saw on your way out from that show. It's a painting with a very uh, attractive, uh, seductive black and white. But along the edge would have vinyl letters that said on top, black on black, mean things I said about other artists, and the opposite, mean things other artists said about me. <laughs> And then I was reading a catalog essay for Gerhard Richter by Benjamin Buchloh, our eminent art historian, uh, for, for, uh, Bob, uh, for uh, not Barbara Gladstone, for Marion Goodman Gallery. And I'm reading it, and I'm nodding my head because what he's saying about Gerhard Richter could have applied to my work. Chiefly, the idea of not trusting the hand, historically <laughs> referencing it back to Surat, who famously did the pontalism, which was a mechanistic act to remove the subjective from painting. So I read it and I read it, and finally, you know, I said, I really should expose the situation because for years I've been very angry that Richter gets a lot of credit for his squeegee paintings but in fact I had shown that kind of method of working in 1973 in a major painting show in Dusseldorf where he showed gray monochromes so what I ended up doing is I blew up the catalog pages and wherever an illustration of a Richter in uh, the catalog, I, ha I could only afford to do it in black and white, obviously. But everywhere one of his illustrations occurred, I slapped on one of my early squeegee paintings. <laughs> and everywhere his name appeared, I crossed it out and supplanted it with my name. 
And the title of this piece is called Synecdoche, which is also in the title of the of the essay. <laughs> and in fact, that yellow painting was the painting I showed in Dusseldorf. Well, anyway, I mean, to do this is in fact an acknowledgement of impoverishment, because there's no way you can win against the status quo. There's no way you can win against the powers that are. It's almost a naked kind of accepting that I can't win in this, but I wanted to do it, you know, and I had fun doing it. <laughs> and, you know, along the same lines of thinking, I realized MoMA would never give me a, ma a major show. <laughs> so in the archives, I would find the actual il invitation for Picasso's 40 years of his art, 1937. So I appropriated the same typography, the same color, the same spacing. And I made that when I only had 25 years of art under my belt. I have since made one that accurately reproduced his card and says 40 years of his art. And as long as you have an invitation for the show, you know there would be a catalog. And so this one is the putative catalog for my show at MoMA with the masks of tragedy and comedy and slanty-eyed David Diel. <laughs> so why stop at MoMA? You know, why not have a show in every major museum in the world? So I wanted to have a show at Santa Pompidou. And once again, I go to archives of, of invitations. I came across one for Joseph Boyce with his characteristic hat, which was a posthumous show. And I said, well, I'm not going to use my own image. I'm, I'm still under the guidance of, uh, you know, uh, assumed humility, shall we say. You don't, <laughs> you don't foreground yourself. So I decided to use the most famous Chinese person that ever lived as my stand-in. And of course, all this typography is absolutely based on the actual boys' catalog, uh, boys' invitation. So as long as I'm having retrospectives in major museums, I thought I'd give one to myself in a Chinese museum. Interestingly, somebody pointed out later, is at that point when I did this painting, which was around 1994, there wasn't any Chinese modern museum. But my thinking was I would not name the museum because I didn't want to take sides between Taiwan and Beijing. And also, the, uh, the calligraphy is old style calligraphy. And in this case, I invited a very famous Chinese calligrapher to do the character writing for me. This painting is called Twin Dragons. It just combines Bruce Lee with Jackson Pollock into a kind of Gerhard Richter-ish center panel, which is actually just the same image misprinted on one another. And I, I sort of like the idea of him with his antique violence and me just calmly reading a newspaper. Me sitting in front of Jackson Pollock's number 32, one of my favorite Jackson Pollock's, which is originally in black and white. I had myself posed in a brown overcoat with a hat in reference to Matisse's uh, famous photograph of him in Saint Paul de Vence in the wintertime wearing similar garb. It's called Dancers, of course. 
oh, this, this one is called lying, as in, you know, uh, telling a lie, but also lying about. Dancing. And a big interest has always been design and architecture, and here it is me sitting in Philip Johnson's glass house. I happened to visit and handed my you know, point and shoot camera to another visitor and said, could you snap my photo? So most times when I use photos, it's not you know, so studied. And also, as I said, maybe I hadn't, but since I never had an art school education, not knowing how to render objects and people in space, whenever I do need something like an image, I use a photographic silkscreen image. And in, ref in, in, archive, in, in researching uh, Philip Johnson, I discovered that he, this is in you know, monographs of his work, he was so careful that he had drawings and scale made for the furniture collection. The corner of the Barcelona chair had to be 14 inches from the edge. So I happened to visit one time, and the building manager said to me, I, I asked, I said, how do you keep the rug so clean? It was a white rug, uh, 14 by 11, I think is the size. He said, well, we always have one that's clean. But then he let drop that the rug shrinks because it's wool. So then I said, well, if the rug shrinks, then the careful carefully measured placement of the furniture could not go on forever. So here it is, the original. <laughs> Eventually, the furniture would end up piled on top of one another. And in the same research, I discovered a visitor asking Philip Johnson, would you ever change the arrangement of your furniture? And his response was, why would I? Would you change anything at Chartres, the cathedral? <laughs> so that allowed me to make a painting using language of that. In the same vein, there's me sitting in that same living room, and Andy Warhol, David Whitney, Philip Johnson's lover, Philip Johnson, Philip Johnson's brother-in-law, and a young Robert, uh, uh, what's his name, the architect who was the head of Yale Art School, Stern, Robert Stern, exactly, in that same space. So I guess I, I was thinking about the divide between, you know, immigrant person and wasdom. Uh, may, maybe some Jewish guy there, but you know, on the whole, this speaks to me of wasps and homosexuals. So that's you know another subtext. So for me, actually, a very important part is the color and the surface. So that's also why I like having big paintings with a lot of empty areas to show off the surface and a place for me to enact that kind of activity. So now, this is the group of work that preceded the show upstairs. And I couldn't have done the show upstairs if I hadn't done this one. You can read, it says there, I lived there until I was six. When I returned to Chindu 30 years later, it had, it, it had just been demolished. There are no photographs. The only certain scale to rub up against my memories was the tennis court. I have since uncovered ciphers of its having been. So that is a small painting, which became the front piece, front piece for the show. You see that first, 
and then the paintings sort of revolve around the room in reference to that language, that text. So there's the tennis court in its measurements. The same information in Chinese, done in such a way as if a person is practicing calligraphy on a gridded paper. I realize at first that my Chinese writing is really bad, but then I thought it's perfect for the job at hand because it's a six-year-old child. And in doing this project, I went to my various cousins, uh, uncles and aunts to ask them for their memories of that house. And I had a hard time because at some point I realized it was more difficult for them because they were more grown up than me. I was only six years old when I left. My uncle was 18. So they lost, they knew what they lost, whereas I didn't know what I lost. But eventually, I prevailed upon them to give me drawings. But in this case, this is from my memory. And the only thing certain is the tennis court. And that, on top, is a kind of timeline beginning with around the time of when the house was built to the present at that point, which was 2010, more or less, 2009. On top is the more uh, institutional, you know, uh, international history of political history, whereas the bottom is more my personal history. And the orange and gray timeline painting upstairs came out of this. But the colors were very specific. The blue is the color of the Kuomintang. Red is the color of the Communist Party. And so much of this history had to do with a kind of military civil war. My grandfather had to escape because he was on the losing side. So some of this color, I think, I was thinking of military uniforms. And maybe the entire painting could be seen as metal ribbons on soldiers. I mean, these are unconscious. I don't plan to do this. As I'm doing them, these references come to me, and then I had to solidify them. But what did, what was clear in my mind was the oscillation in this story between the word or the character to construct and the character to destroy. There is the character to construct telling you the way to construct it. The first stroke, the second stroke, the third stroke, fourth, fifth, sixth, seventh, and eighth. And then that's the character for destroy, to demolish. What's interesting is China is so hell-bent on destruction and demolition that you see this character on the doors of a lot of houses. And when I first did this group of work, I didn't show any maps because it was shown in Beijing. And presumably, people in Beijing knew where every place was. They would know where Chengdu is in the province of Sichuan. When I did a sim similar, a second version of this show in New York, I needed to supply people with the locale. Hence, the maps came in. But then this case was always there. That's a scan of the original plot plan of the house official that I found in my father's papers after he died. And that's the plot. That's the deed and the envelope in which they were found sort of repeated and made into like an arch for a doorway. I mean, the, the copy of the deed I had was a letter-sized paper in Xerox black. I rendered it into the seal red and about this big. The interesting thing about the story is unexpected, uncanny connections. 
I discovered that a very famous book, uh, The Wild Swans, which was a very popular book written by a dissident Chinese woman who got completely disenamored of communism and now lives in London. And uh, she wrote a book about the three generations of women in her own family. And within the book, it was revealed that her father was the editor of the Sichuan Daily newspaper, which happened, from my own knowledge, to be the organ that confiscated and took over my family's home. So this weird thing of this connection of her father being in my family's home. And furthermore, my father, my real father, dies while playing tennis in New York. So, you know, the tennis court certainly was a lay motif of this group. And it, it's used repeatedly as a kind of, as I said in the statement in the beginning, cipher. But also the reference is, of course, to geometrical abstract painting. The way a tennis court is divided could be analogous to how paintings are divided up. And it also oscillated between the red clay of Roland Garros and the clay, uh, the green of Wimbledon. And as I was flying here, I flew over the Flushing uh, Tennis Center in New York, and I noticed that they have a characteristic blue. So I have a chance to do a blue one. That is the masthead of the Sichuan Daily put on top of the tennis court. Interesting is the calligraphy for major newspapers in China were always in the calligraphy of Mao Zedong. And there's the Chinese flag doing the same thing. And that was encapsulated that escape for me from China from to Hong Kong. We were only allowed one suitcase per person. The other two uh, tennis, tennis balls. I mean, a lot of what I do is this, but I'm always trying to reference it back to, again, my specific home base of New York art. It happens in the paintings upstairs, references to Rothko, Clifford Still, who have you, Sai Twombly in the blackboard. Here, specifically, it's referencing a painting by Jasper Johns, saying uh, the title was uh, Of Two Square, uh, Of Two Balls, not Of Two Squares, Of Two Balls. And of course, he's famous, Ellsworth Kelly, for his leaf drawings. And we happen to have had a huge ginkgo tree on the property. This one, once again, references back to another hero of mine, Robert Motherwell. This painting is called Open, Surrender, and Mourn. Motherwell has a very famous group of work that he called Open Series. And they mostly have a rectangle coming down the top as the white rectangle here is positioned. But in China, in, in Chinese uh, tradition, white is the color of mourning as opposed to black. So here it's mourning my father's death on the tennis court and the surrendering of the house to the communists. I, I guess a lot of my interest is like looking at the underside of things or that which is passed over uh, issues and people. In this case, I hopped upon the Russian avant-gardist architect Melikov. He had a very important career having built the Russian pavilion in Paris in 25. He did uh, amazing stuff, but he was shut down. 
His, it, basically, his colleagues were very jealous of him, and they took his license away. So for the last 40 plus years of his life, he was like a hermit in a building that he designed himself, which has important world status. It's two conjoining circles, almost like a Venn diagram, if you look at it from on top. And uh, th this house has been in the news a lot. It's, it's on the point of just collapsing, but anyway, it's still extant for the moment. So this is the cover of a book on him. This is just something I give myself uh, you know, freedom to do from time to time, actual trans transcriptions of real books as opposed to made-up covers. And that's an image of the studio he had, one of the circles with uh, this hexagonal window. And basically, I'm applying the same formal strategy that I did with the Malevich photograph in approaching this particular image. You know, taking out architectural reference and just putting the paintings, and in this case, the windows in the painting. So to put something in that green space, I decided on his initials, Konstantin Melikov. And it was only when I put that down that it occurred to me is the same initials as Kazimir Malevich. So that gave me a chance to do this painting. And those are smaller versions of his windows. There's one painting, one window in the entire house of 53 windows that's not six-sided. And it's not here. I didn't. I, I have a painting of that, but I didn't do it here. Sorry. That is hexagonal still. <coughs> this is a painting from the Barnett Newman group of thirty. One of the early ones. And. What it is, is every painting he made in scale, in the year it's made, the painting was sold really early. And at some point, the collector put it in an auction without a reserve, which means oftentimes there's a reserve. If the bidding doesn't get to that level, the painting is withdrawn. And so it's not sold. It goes back to the person consigning it. In this case, there was no reserve, so the painting went to whoever bid on it. Even if somebody had bid a dollar, they could have had it. But in any case, the painting at the time might have been worth $70,000. The person got it for 7000 So as a result, for about 10 years, beyond the earlier fallow period, I couldn't sell a painting. But then I was doing a show, and somebody reviewing the show discovered that I had made paintings of the auction pages where the tragedy occurred. So he went on the internet and discovered that the same painting was coming up for auction again in three days. So I went and bid the painting back at low bid. I was able to get it for 15. It's no longer seven. But I knew I had something. One, I love the painting. And two, I potentially could sell it for a lot more, which I actually won't, because I think I have to hold on to this now for myself. <laughs> but it allowed me to make a painting of the history of its travels through the auction market. The first one tells you, you know, where it was made and who bought it. And second one, first auction, second, uh, second auction, and finally, home again. So in the same vein of like, uh, you know, revealing various things that happen in relation to the market and to institutions, 
I have very clear memory of hanging this painting of mine in the famous Philip Johnson trustee's room at MoMA, which has subsequently been taken down because they rebuilt the museum for the third time. So the name of this painting is Double Rejection because I hung my painting there with the idea that the, trust, uh, the Board of uh, Acquisitions would vote on buying it or not. They voted against. So it's double rejection. They rejected Philip Johnson's trustee room and they rejected my painting. But I still have the painting, 16 and a half feet wide. Using that earlier method of the cardboard tubes, you know, in order to achieve a sense of heroic scale, if you will, a painting as if made by a giant. This is the last slide, and I decided to use it because it's actually done on the back of a painting I did here at Kenyon. The other side has some juven juvenilia on it. <laughs> But I think it's actually an interesting painting because it invokes all the things I've been talking about, which is it tells a story, but it's completely embedded in the idea of painting or the history of painting. If you were to hang a painting, you would always have an up and down to tell you which direction to hang it. So this would be on the back of every painting. But in this case, it's going to show which way up, as in the Barnett Newman and the de Kooning. I can't promise that I'll always show it as half full. I think I'll leave it at that. <laughs> oh, yes, absolutely. That's the so best we'll part. Some, some Q&A for a little while? Yes, that would be great. Oh, I, that's too strong. I'll stand here. Yeah. How did you get through the fallow years? The years? How did I get through the fallow yeah. years? Well, it's always difficult, you know. I took myself to Paris, for one thing. I, I said to myself, well, I'm reading all these French people anyway. I could go read them there. And I didn't read them. I, you know, I was too lazy. I couldn't get into it. Um, I mean, you know, fallow years happens every other day. You know, it's not easy to maintain. People have the notion that artists are, you know, plugging away in the studio every day. But all that moments of like unconscious is part of doing the work too. You know, that, that dream state in the morning, sometimes those are the times I get my best ideas. And Hopefully the work isn't about sheer labor, even though in my case it often is because I work so hard at achieving the kind of surface that I want. But for me, those times are valuable because it's just thinking time. As long as I'm make, making the paint, I'm thinking of what I'm going to do next. But in the general sense of the fallow period, well, there's no, there's no answer. You just have to grin and bear it and get through it. Yes. Well, it's interesting because, you know, that is not something a six to 11 year old kid would have made. This is ex post facto. This is me as an adult going back and picking out things that might be important. I realized that there was very little I could put in in the personal part of the time chart. You know, what I did, my favorite ice cream place, that's not very interesting. Um, so I decided in the end there was better left completely empty and 
put in the things at the bottom that are of importance to me now, in retrospect. When we were upstairs a little bit earlier, you did say that there was one thing that you liked, but in the orange part that was there was... It, it's true, person. but that's sort of a long story. Yeah. You willing to bear with it? Mm -hmm. I'll try. Yeah. It's a really great story. <laughs> well, there is one event in the five years I lived in Hong Kong that's seared into my mind. And that is my uncle, who was coming, a U.S. educated economist, decided to go back to China to work for the revolution in 53. He stopped in Hong Kong to see his father, my grandfather. And my memory is of like the loud battle and quarrel that they ensued between them. The father would say, you cannot, you're stupid to go back to the communists. You know, they'll kill you or something. They'll, I don't know if he said that. But anyway, uh, incredible political you know, difference between a retired Kuomintang general and an idealistic son, Western educated, going home to work for his country. The point is, two years later, there was a big purge of everyone under the slogan, let a hundred flowers bloom. And my uncle was purged and suffered a great deal. And his wife went crazy. And, but the really amazing part is he managed to then get back out of China and ended his life as a person very high up in the voice of America broadcasting to Asia. So that's quite, I mean, I don't know how to put that in the little space of yeah. the top. So in the end, I, it's, it's, I mean, maybe there's a chance for me to make something out of it, yeah, at some point. At some point, I just decided, you know, I couldn't hold it in anymore, I guess. That this stuff is possibly of more general interest. And I had to let go of uh, propriety. And, you know, as you can see, I don't mind revealing the most base of instincts. I have no secrets. No, in fact, for the moment, it's not going to, but it may, it may. But my big objective right now is to marry the Demolish House group with the one upstairs. I think the two together could make an interesting showing. And uh, I, I'm hoping and waiting for that to happen. Yeah, it may, I mean, I'm well, it's very, oh, I'm sorry, I can't hear you. I'm thinking specifically about the Dhamma Rinpoche symbol and the um, one upstairs, but is it inherent that he's, um, or can you do as a series? Do you think you can have it? It is important to. I, I still quite. I am not sleeping. Um, is it important that these series be viewed holistically or as a group together? Oh, it, 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 do, do I only, would I only show them together? Yeah. Well, that's a problem because, you know, I, I was trying to say to people showing them that they, uh, not so much for this group upstairs, but for the earlier group that I wanted, one group has already been bought by a major museum in Hong Kong, the M+. The second version of it is with a Spanish dealer in Madrid. And I was trying to tell her that she should sell the whole thing together, but she's already sold some separately. So already that's not possible. But then I realized since the first group, which is 
complete enough is already in a museum collection that I can possibly let the second group go individually. Because one of the things that one discovers under postmodernism, if you will, is that there's nothing whole. You know, everything is in part, and as long as things have been put into the discourse, it can be retrieved. I mean, people who buy one painting, if they're smart enough and curious enough, they will find out about the other parts. And who would have room to hang 30 paintings in one space? Thank you. Thank you. Well, this, that was delightful. Thank you very much. <laughs>